Hello, and uh, welcome to the OECD's Skills and Lifelong Learning After the Pandemic webinar. My name is Eric Morath, and I'm a labor reporter at the Wall Street Journal, and I'm so glad that you could join us uh, here today. Uh, in a, just a bit, we'll have a uh, presentation from the OECD's Aliza Mohamedou, um, and then we'll hear from our expert panel uh, on this important topic. Um, you know, me and, and others at the Wall Street Journal have been writing about uh, lifelong learning and skills development for a number of years. It's, it's been a priority of policymakers in Washington for uh, several uh, administrations now. But the global pandemic um, really caused a lot of us to reassess um, where we are when it comes to skills development and, and the future of work. Uh, the pandemic caused uh, the largest short-term displacement of workers in the US and, and probably most of the rest of the world on record. Um, jobs that were done uh, for centuries in person uh, became digital jobs. Uh, we're seeing evidence that automation and other labor-saving technologies um, could be accelerating. Um, and global supply chains are being rethought and that will have implications for workers around the world. Um, you know, so that's why I'm so excited uh, to hear um, the OECD's 2021 skills outlook and hear from uh, the experts um, on our panel. Before uh, we begin, and I introduce uh, our, our speakers and panelists, just a, a few uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, the report that Elisa will present today is available at, as you can see, OECD slash Skills Outlook 2021. After the presentation, we'll have a panel discussion during which we'll also read out audience questions. Please put your questions for our speakers in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can during the second half of today's webinar. Finally, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available to participants in the days following the event. Uh, now I'd like to hand it over to Elisa for uh, her presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, very happy to be joining you today. Um, I'll start sharing my screen if you allow me to just to make uh, this presentation. And um, particularly happy to be doing this actually today on, on uh, the World Youth Skills Day. Um, lifelong learning uh, is crucial for all individuals to adapt and thrive in uh, the changing world in which we are uh, shaped by the mega trends that we all know of, uh, whether these are technical changes, uh, technological changes, globalization, uh, uh, population aging, but also, of course, uh, the current crisis we're still in. And our report really emphasizes that it's uh, crucial to build skills early on. Um, but also that it is equally important to ensure that all youngsters um, develop a habit of learning and a love of learning as well uh, that will accompany them throughout their life. Um, so our re research shows that um, individuals who have a lifelong learning uh, mindset are more likely to develop key competences. Um, so students who are motivated to master tasks, who have ambitious learning goals and who enjoy reading uh, at age 15, also have higher achievement scores in reading, mathematics and uh, science. Um, but the link between learning attitudes and uh, proficiency scores holds true not only for uh, 15 years old, but for multiple uh, population groups, including adults. And, and this particular figure here shows that for uh, young adults age uh, 26, 28, we see that a high drive to learn is associated with uh, a higher proficiency scores um, across all of the key competences, like literacy, numeracy, and problem solving in technology rich environments. What we learn from this figure is, and, and the previous one, is that individuals who are able to develop positive learning attitudes early on built upon foundational skills to gain stronger skills and are on a path for receiving more from their education at all uh, stages of uh, life. Um, next, our, our report also confirms 
some of the messaging that our education colleagues uh, here today uh, have been putting forward, which is that parents and teachers are crucial to promote the development of lifelong learning attitudes among children. And the pandemic made, of course, the work of both parents and teachers harder to fulfill precisely at a time when promoting uh, strong learning attitudes such as self-efficacy became so important. And, and in many countries, we have to recognize a targeted support was put in place to facilitate the work of families and schools. And teachers also collaborated across the globe to, to improve methods of, for uh, retaining interest and motivation during uh, remote schooling. So, but it will really be essential that this type of support is strengthened uh, during and after recovery to make sure in particular that the most uh, vulnerable populations are reached. And I'll touch upon that uh, later on, because that's also one of the, the insights that comes out from, from the report. Um, because one of the worrying findings that we highlight in the report is that already before the pandemic, um, because the data referred to 2018, low achieving students were increasingly lagging behind their high achieving peers. Uh, and this figures here uh, compares the change in uh, literacy achievement between 2000 and 2018 of students um, at different levels of ability, and it's based on data of 15-year-old uh, students surveyed in, in PISA, which is uh, this uh, uh, effort that the OECD has been doing for years with countries that you're all, uh, I'm sure, very familiar with. And across OECD countries, the, the lowest achievers had lower levels of performance in 2018 than their counterparts in 2000. And uh, precisely because we're in this world that is rapidly changing and with increasingly rewarding higher levels of skills, uh, even stable results would be, would be uh, problematic, let alone uh, declining ones. Um, in the United States, the trend is flat. So there's no worsening uh, conditions for the lowest achievers and no average changes uh, from 2000 to 2018. Um, we find that uh, on average, across OECD countries, achievement grows during the transition from the end of compulsory schooling to early uh, adulthood. However, this trend is not seen everywhere. Uh, in the US, the increase was 11 points, which is in line with the OECD uh, average increase of 13 points. So participating in further education and training, as well as in the labor market, in other words, having high quality learning opportunities is important to develop skills. And uh, failure to engage youngsters in, in high quality learning opportunities is clearly associated with a lower uh, development of key competences during this important uh, period. Um, one thing that is clear is that at the end of um, the relatively standardized educational experience of schools can be an important moment to ensure that young people with different aspirations and talents have the learning opportunities they need to thrive. But um, diversification also means that without the right support, uh, particularly guidance and quality assurance mechanisms, some youngsters could face lower quality opportunities and could pursue learning opportunities that don't really allow them to flourish. One, one of the points I'd like to, to emphasize a bit more is this issue of disparities. So the report highlights that on average at age 15, children whose parents did not obtain a tertiary degree performed less well than children with at least one parent who uh, obtained a tertiary degree. And these children generally improved less during the transition years. They were less likely to pursue tertiary studies and were less likely to pursue high quality vocational training. Um, and when in work, they were less likely to use their skills and were more likely to be not in education, employment or training. So, so targeted support will be key in order to lower the inequalities that uh, occur during this stage and that we're, we're seeing uh, very clearly. The, the issue of disparities is, is, is widespread. Um, the figure shows the association between disparities in achievement uh, at age 15 and uh, age 27 uh, between those with parents with and without tertiary qualifications. And on the horizontal uh, um, x-axis are the achievement differences for students where neither parent has a tertiary degree. The vertical y-axis um, improvise 
achievement differences for students where at least one parent holds a tertiary degree. So achievement growth in, in uh, countries which are very close to the 45 degree uh, line is very equal for students irrespective of their background. So the further one moves towards uh, north and east, the higher achievement growth is. Um, countries below the 45 degree line are countries where achievement grew uh, more among children with parents not educated at the tertiary level and those countries above the 45 line uh, um, are countries where achievement grow among uh, children whose parents obtained a tertiary degree. So let's compare the US with, with Germany and um, the US is above the 45 degree line while Germany is below this. The, this. What this means is that in the US disparities in um, achievement grew because the growth in achievement is marked among individuals with tertiary educated parents. Uh, increases is, is more than 20, 12 points, while lower educated, there is no increase. In Germany, uh, the opposite is the case. Uh, disparities are shrinking, uh, and the increase among children of tertiary educated parents was 12 points. And among the individuals, among the children of individuals with no parent educated at the tertiary level, this was 24 points. There are different reasons for this, uh, why uh, lower uh, social economic uh, uh, students were, were not left behind in the German education system. There are different reasons for that, um, particularly because uh, Germany successfully raised the literacy rate for um, a low social economic um, uh, class background children. Uh, more so than, than higher ones. We also hypothesize that this is related to Germany's vocational apprenticeship system, uh, which is uh, designed to provide learning to low achievers uh, and kids from uh, these backgrounds and combine in-school and work site uh, vocational uh, training together. So it's really some of the messaging around is, is, uh, is, is important in terms of the comparative statistics. Um, but skills are also built beyond young adulthood, uh, in, in particularly in this world where we are increasingly rewarding innovating, uh, innovative skills and we're in this uh, fast changing technologies, individuals who have a lifelong learning mindset are more adaptable and versatile and therefore um, uh, are able to gain novel skills demanded by the labor market. So, Yet already before the pandemic, few adults engaged in adult learning. And we estimate that during the pandemic, participation declined even further. Uh, and worryingly, many were disengaged from, from learning. If we take uh, 10 individuals as an example, before the pandemic, on average, across the OECD um, countries, four individuals reported participating in adult learning, and six reported not having participated. And out of the six uh, who did not participate, five reported not being willing to take part in available opportunities. Um, and only one out of 10 reported being willing and uh, ready to, to take part. So there's, there's clearly an issue and, and uh, it's not necessarily a disengagement of people, but also perhaps uh, accessing these opportunities and understanding what that entails and having the time as well to, to, um, to go into this. We find large differences in participation in uh, adult learning based on educational background, with as many as six in 10 adults with a tertiary education participating in adult learning, and only two in 10 adults with at most lower secondary qualifications participating, furthering even more inequalities in skills uh, development. Um, Additionally, large variations exist across OECD countries. For example, um, in the US, one in two adults participates, uh, around 35% do not participate and report not being willing to participate in available learning opportunities on the job, and 15% uh, report not being currently engaged but being willing to do so. So there, again, there's many reasons for this, often related to the lack of knowledge of possibilities, the lack of time, or the sense, perhaps the a different sense of the usefulness of the training itself. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, uh, severely affected the economy and some people losing, uh, unfortunately, their jobs, but having built a lifelong learning mindset equips people with the necessary prerequisites to acquire new skills or to search for alternative employment opportunities. This has proven to be 
a necessary foundation to adjust to, but also to recover from the pandemic and, and uh, potentially other future crises. The pandemic has further reduced opportunities to engage in lifelong learning because social uh, distancing requirements have often um, replaced classroom learning and training with distance instruction. Additionally, for those unable to transition to remote work, loss of jobs during the pandemic, uh, reduced important learning opportunities. And the estimates we have suggest that during hard lockdowns, participation in uh, informal learning, which we define as learning that occurs, observing and working with colleagues in, in OECD country, that type of learning decreased by an average of 25%. And participation in non-formal learning, which is the uh, participation in workshops and, and on the job training, that decreased by 18%. And, and although estimated learning losses in OECD countries vary across sectors and they correlate, of course, with shutdowns in, in economic activities, they're also determined by workers' existing competencies. Um, the decline, by the way, in, in the US was exactly similar to the OECD countries with, with absolute uh, levels uh, higher, actually. So um, the pandemic also showed us that those who have uh, strong digital skills are more resilient to shocks. Uh, for example, they were more likely to be able to work from home when working from home requirements became a feature in many sectors. But the pandemic and more general trends toward digitalization of our economies also increased the demand for individuals who, for example, will be able to develop applications that are needed in a digital economy. By um, 2029, the demand for software developers is expected to increase significantly, more than 20%. And so the demand for its underlying digital skills, such as the knowledge of uh, software and programming principles, as well as that of specific technologies, such as SQL, Java, and so on, um, will also uh, be increasing. Um, our report considers the rapidly changing um, skills requirements and the occupational level changes projected to occur over 10 years due to technological and demographic changes. And results suggest that many 15 year old students expect to be working in such occupations despite their shrinking relevance. Um, in the US, there seems to be more awareness than in other countries, but in general, education systems need to provide greater guidance uh, and orientation to shape youngsters' educational training and labor market decisions. Uh, still, it's important to design adult learning systems that will enable older cohorts to adjust and move to growing occupations uh, and identify what new skills these individuals will need and how these can be provided. Um, I'll very quickly take an example of an occupation that is projected to uh, decline by 20. 29 in the US, that of executive secretaries and administrative assistants. And we're talking here about 600,000 jobs that could be affected. So based on the skills requested in online uh, vacancies and in new ads for these posts, because the research we've done was around online vacancies, we find that the, the 20 most demanded skills include organizing office supplies, event planning and management, office design, and etc. cetera. Um, administrative service and facilities managers and public relations specialists fall within the skill neighborhood of executive secretaries and executive administrative assistants, but are projected to grow uh, um, uh, by 6% and 7% respectively in the next decade. So we have here a nice mirroring effect uh, in the sense that we can, we can look at these, at these um, occupations patients as, as an alternative. And the figure il illustrates 20 skills that are important for administrative service and facilities managers to master, but they are generally not necessary to work as executive secretaries and administrative assist assistants. And therefore would most likely be part of retraining needs um, should executive secretaries and administrative assistants decide to move into administrative service and facilities managers jobs. Mm -hmm. So, if we look further, similarly, public relations specialists are in the skill neighboring region of executive secretaries and executive administrative uh, assistants and are projected to grow. Um, public relations specialists share various skills and knowledge areas with executive uh, secretaries and executive administrative assistants, including the ability to plan and manage events. The two occupations differ 
uh, most notably in that the uh, public relations specialists also engage in promotional campaigns, general marketing, marketing strategies. So all in all, um, the identification of skills combined with the upskilling and reskilling policies allows us to address labor market shifts. Um, just to finish off with a couple of key policy lessons um, that we really want to perhaps also the panelists to look into for and, and further discuss for us. That one thing we've seen is that lifelong learning policies require strong coordination and collaboration between different actions. That's why we're really happy to have as well on this panel, the private sector alongside uh, government representatives, ensuring affordability and accessibility. The issues of the disparities I mentioned before is essential, spreading costs across individuals and the broader community, but also employers, all institutions should ensure that barriers to participation in learning are reduced. The creation and partnerships as well um, is important, um, but also really the, the idea that individuals' ability to adapt and thrive in a fast evolving world rests on their having acquired strong foundational skills, the willingness to learn and a habit of, of learning, what we call this lifelong learning attitude, um, harnessing as well the power of technology to expand access to lifelong learning opportunities. Um, technology low lowers the cost of accessing opportunities to develop technical skills, and as such, it can be a powerful tool to promote engagement in lifelong learning, um, but at the same time being mindful of the inequalities it can create, promoting innovation, um, the current fragmentation of formal, informal, and non-formal learning provision can be employed, exploited to promote experimentation in learning provision through innovative programs and approaches and a culture of program evaluation as well is essential if we move into policy implementation. Um, and also making sure that thriving um, lifelong learning systems place the learners at the center. We need to recognize the heterogeneous nature of lifelong learning uh, and of lifelong learners. Lifelong learning, it, it occurs, as I said, in those informal, non-formal, informal settings. It involves individuals, both young and old, uh, with different experiences, motivations, and attitudes. It's, it's therefore essential to diversify the content and the provision of learning to account for the inherently uh, heterogeneous nature of learning and learners. Diversification should also encompass both content and providers, not only does a diversified uh, provision of learning um, opportunities ensure quality. It can also help inform individuals' choices and increase their motivation to participate in lifelong learning. Empowering learners to engage in lifelong learning, uh, these diverse learning opportunities allow each individual learner to who is equipped with initial skills and information to define and continually update their, their learning paths. Um, and with that, I will uh, just uh, mention that there's a lot more in the report, of course, this is just a glimpse and uh, hand over back to you, um, uh, Eric. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I very much appreciate it. Appreciate you uh, joining our, our panel here that we're about to uh, kick off. I uh, want to introduce our other panelists. We have Angela Hanks, uh, counselor to the secretary at the US Department of Labor. We have Maureen McLaughlin, Senior Advisor to the Secretary and Director of International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Education. And we have Ardeen Williams, Vice President, Workforce Development, HQ2 at Amazon. Thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm going to uh, kick off uh, our questions uh, to Angela. Uh, you know, Angela, what do you think the Department of Labor views as the biggest challenge it faces in the area of skills acquisition for work? Are, are there certain programs or strategies the Biden administration is pursuing to address these challenges? And do you think that approach is different because of the pandemic? Uh, yes, so first of all, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for having me today. I'm very excited to be included in this very important OEC event. And we at the Department of Labor are extensively using best in class research and data and policy analysis in order to, um, uh, to uh, that you and your colleagues provide. Um, and as we embrace the advice that emerges from our colleagues and our member countries, uh, uh, we look forward to continuing to convene with you all uh, to answer and discuss some really important questions. And then finally, I just wanna congratulate the OECD Secretariat and now the 38 
uh, OECD member countries on the 60th anniversary of such rich collaboration and cooperation. Uh, so to get to your question, um, I, I think there are a few things here. Um, so, uh, so certainly I think that there are some sort of bigger uh, problems that precede the pandemic, and then there are some that are made specifically more acute as a result. So, so stepping back and starting with the particular challenges that DOL was trying to solve pre-pandemic, um, I think it, it lends really nicely to the presentation that we just heard, you know, especially for, for marginalized groups, for, for low-income people, for people of color in the U.S., um, you know, we know that people uh, face a particular set of challenges around skills acquisition. Some of those are, are about access, some of those are about income, and so many of the programs that we try to provide um, really do try to, to look at those particular challenges that that really the most um, underserved communities face. So, for example, um, we uh, have sort of moved toward uh, doing in more of our, our grant making and more of our work, um, this move towards sort of a more sectoral model or, or proven practices like apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs. Um, and the reason for this is we know that these are really strong pathways into good jobs, and they also tend to address um, a lot of the barriers that exist outside of the explicit training space, right? So in the sector model, um, it's about sort of bringing together many partners across industry, labor, education, um, the workforce uh, development system in the US um, to create models that really address the needs of uh, the whole worker and learner, right? So it's not just the training, which is incredibly important and we want it to be customized and demand driven, but we also want to make sure that people have access to things like childcare and income supports, um, the things that are real barriers for many people um, to both access skills training, but also um, to, to enter and remain in the labor market. So I, I would say um, that's sort of something that grounds many of our grants. Um, and and uh, just to speak a little bit about what that's meant in the pandemic, um, you know, this has been a really challenging time for many people. In addition to the labor market just like bottoming out overnight, basically, and and many millions of jobs being lost, which certainly is is difficult when you're trying to participate in um, or build a demand driven program when there's no demand. That's very hard, right? Um, uh, many of the services that we provide also had to go virtual. Um, so there are 24 American jobs, 2,400 American job centers across the country. They all started providing virtual services last year. Um, and in many ways, I think that's gone very well, but certainly it's a difference between being able to go into a physical location and talk to someone face-to-face, -face, um, being able to participate in a training program physically. Certainly, you know, the apprenticeship programs, for example, are on-the-job learning programs. Um, when you can't go on the job because it's unsafe, it's harder to, to complete those programs and get, and get the, the skills that you need. So, so certainly that has affected the environment for being able to acquire those skills. Certainly now we're in a, a different environment in many respects. We have vac vaccinations increasing. We're increasingly seeing more people enter, re-enter the labor market, which is great. Um, so some of those concerns have uh, uh, abated. I will say, I think that now that we're sort of moving out of that immediate crisis mode, there are some things that we can now look back on um, and, and the president has proposed some really ambitious proposals in this respect to, to think about like, what were the things that we weren't doing pre-pandemic or weren't doing enough of um, that would really help sort of boost access to these types of programs um, and improve pathways into the labor market. So um, as part of the American Jobs Plan, uh, which the president rolled out a few months ago, um, he proposed uh, $100 billion in new investments in workforce development programs. And those investments are really geared toward ensuring that we're doing what works, that we're providing services to underserved communities, and that we're really boosting the capacity of the system to double down on, uh, on the things that we know work very well. Um, so, so in that first bucket, um, you know, some of the things that, that uh, we've highlighted are um, investments in industry and sector partnerships. Like I said, these really bring together a lot of the key partners to provide those demand-driven programs. Um, that also includes uh, investments in comprehensive supports for dislocated workers. Again, this is really, um, in addition to the training, the types of income support, childcare, transportation that people need to be able to get to work. Supports for underserved communities, including folks who have interactions with the justice system, uh, folks who uh, would benefit from subsidized employment, particularly young people um, who we know um, really benefit from those programs. And then finally, in this sort of bucket around building capacity, really focusing on the things that we know have been effective. So um, I, I will highlight in particular registered apprenticeship that's been a big priority of the president and this administration because we know that apprenticeship programs 
our job right away, right? Like we know that people are going to get into a job that pays a wage. You're going to get really customized um, and high quality training. Um, you're going to get paid more over time. Um, and the, those jobs also come with strong uh, labor standards and equal opportunity employment protections as well. So I think that's sort of in many ways, um, not that we have sort of one single gold standard, I suppose, but one of the really, uh, I think, important ways that we can help um, sort of improve uh, the quality of training, improve training outcomes, and do that for a broader population as we think about diversifying into new industries and among new populations, particularly marginalized groups. So I'll stop there because I know we're going to talk much more, but uh, really glad to be here. Yeah, no, thank you for those those thoughts. And I, I want to turn uh, to Maureen. Uh, as, as we've been discussing, uh, the labor markets worldwide are changing rapidly and the occupations and skills that are in high demand today, you know, might not be uh, in the future. And we just saw in the report that uh, looking at the career expectations of young adults uh, in the U.S., around two of, of ten are will be working in occupations that are expected to shrink. Um, so I'd like to ask you, uh, from your uh, perspective at the department, you know, what is the U.S. doing to provide educational and career guidance to young people to guide them into occupations with good future prospects? And how has the pandemic changed that approach, if at all? Um, thanks, Eric, and um, thanks for including us in this uh, panel today. And uh, in addition to my job in the U.S. Department of Education, which you mentioned, I also chair the Education Policy Committee for OECD uh, and the work that is in this skills report and that Eliza presented are key parts of the kind of work of learning from other countries um, about what's happening and how we may move ahead more effectively. So just to add that into the, to the mix. Um, there's a lot in the question that you asked, Eric, and I'm going to sort of address a couple of things, and then I assume other pieces will come out later. The issue about jobs of the future, I mean, we hear over and over again about how many jobs people are going to have in their lifetime, how many job changes people will make, um, how many jobs are not out there now that, uh, that will be as people um, come out of school and age, and that all really reinforces um, the whole picture of what we should be giving people as a set of skills and a set of competencies and to, to deal with life and work and, and everything. So that the emphasis for the Department of Education is very much from the foundational um, education that Eliza mentioned, which is, you know, what's happening in preschool, what's happening in K to 12, what's happening then also after people leave high school, what opportunities do they have? Angela mentioned apprenticeships as one piece. There are many opportunities for people to go on and we want people to come out of high school ready to be able to take advantage of the op options and the opportunities that make most sense for them. But what we know is we don't have an equal education system. We know we have many inequities in our education system as do other countries around the world. And that those inequities you know, are very much around uh, black, Hispanic, um, low income, rural populations, um, inner city, there are many inequities and those inequities were laid bare even more by the pandemic. So it's not that they weren't there. It's not that we didn't know they were there, but the pandemic has really highlighted so much what those inequities are. It, it just sort of laid them bare and other countries have found that to be the case as well. And not only did it lay them bare, but it exacerbated them in many cases. So, so one of the biggest emphases of the Biden administration of Secretary Cardona is the building back better. So it's not that we want to go back to the education that we had pre-pandemic last March of 2020. We want to go back to something that's better. So it's addressing uh, both the quality and the equity and that we can never take our eyes off the equity issue because if we can't improve things for everybody, that that's just really a big problem. Um, and so it's really how do you come in and take the lessons from the pandemic, be it lessons of social and emotional skills, um, the whole attention to the fact you need skills, but you need resilience. If, if the pandemic didn't show us anything, it's the need for resilience on an individual basis, on a school basis, on a state basis, on a country basis, the resilience has to be there. Um, mental and emotional health is really important. Again, the pandemic further highlighted that. So you've got your needs for the skill development, for the literacy, for the strong foundation, but you have all these other pieces around it. And I think the presentation that Eliza uh, gave us really highlighted many of those attributes and how those attributes are very much tied to a lifelong learning mindset. 
and that they are instilled beginning when you're young and hopefully they grow over time. But in some cases, what Eliza was showing is they actually get worse or the, the ability to, to take on lifelong learning opportunities or to switch from a job, job or a sector that, that is not existing anymore or isn't growing is so much tied to that, that mindset and that ability to sort of be resilient, to operate well in circumstances where there's not there's a lot of ambiguity where you need to be able to problem solve critical think thinking gain new skills that are the ones that are coming into demand so that's i think part of what i would really emphasize and that there's lots of work going on um, as i think everyone in this panel knows the primary responsibility for education in this country is at the state and local level so the decisions that are made about reopening schools about what schools are doing to try and address the inequities that are laid bare for instance adding in summer school programs, adding in after school programs, adding in um, more counseling, supporting their teachers who often in many cases also had a difficult time um, during the pandemic. So those things are actually happening you know, at the state level, at the school level, at the district level. The federal government is providing lots of support through, the, through ARA um, you know, and there's resources there for schools to be able to figure out what they need. Like if, what is it that they need in their particular area? Is it technology things? Is it um, summer school? Is it catch up for certain students? Is it, you know, it, again, there's the issues of meals for kids who don't have, have you know, good nutrition. Uh, but there's really substantial resources at the K-12 level and at the higher education level to help schools, universities, communities figure out what they need most in their area to address these issues. And a couple of things that um, the secretary is doing that are part of the federal role is the putting a spotlight on these things. It is bringing in examples of what communities are doing so other communities can learn from it. And so the secretary has convened several um, summits, uh, one on reopening schools, and it brought in teams from, from districts about how did you reopen your schools? And it had a teacher, it had a, it had a student, it had a, the head of facilities of like, how did you clean the buildings and, and help with air, air filtration and things. So that, so that there was that one summit on the reopening of schools, another summit recently on equity. And um, these, these things are part of the helping people to have the information they need. And to, again, none of us needs to recreate the wheel. And so when we hear what somebody is doing that works, it's really helpful both within the country and from other countries to be able to say, hey, that's an interesting idea. Let me try it in my context. How would it work in my context? So those are a couple of things, there's lots more. Um, but uh, I assume we'll come back to them in, in future questions. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and so we've gotten a great uh, overview of, of what the uh, federal government is working on with its uh, partners. I wanna bring in uh, the private uh, sector perspective, uh, Dean from Amazon. Um, you know, saw in the presentation in the report that lifelong learning is important uh, in an ever-changing world. Um, and the report also noted that uh, some of the key challenges to engage uh, learners, particularly in the face of the global pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit about your role at Amazon and more broadly about Amazon's approach? What role does a company like Amazon play in this effort? Well, Eric, thank you. It's really a, a privilege to be here. So Amazon is the second largest private employer in the US and we have a role to play in creating good jobs. And we believe that good jobs comprise three things. The first is fair pay. So we have a minimum starting wage of $15 an hour, access to egalitarian benefits from day one. And most, uh, most important from my perspective is the ability to add skills to experience. And when you provide uh, our associates the opportunity to add skills to experience, you help them if they don't already have that lifelong learning mindset, develop it and then build the skills that they need to either advance in the, in the career that they're in or to make a transition to another. And we do this uh, across the board, but the programs in which I'm involved that, are the, that I see as the highest impact are programs like our career choice uh, program, which is focused exclusively on our hourly workers. And this is a first dollar program. And what we do is identify in-demand jobs in the local community that pay more than we do and provide a career path. And we do that through Bureau of Labor Statistics data as well as third-party data like burning glass. 
And then when we identify those, then work with local educators, whether it is through community college, private educators, to, to identify the knowledge, skills, and experience, or knowledge, skills, and abilities that are necessary for those roles, and then tailor the program. So for example, if you've got an area that needs advanced manufacturing, the skills for that may be a little bit different if they're in aerospace versus uh, the medical technical area. So working with not only the education providers, but then also with the employers on the other end, because the, the goal of our program is to make improved employment the outcome of that education. And then to remove the last but not least, remove friction for adult learners, because we are talking about people who are past, typically past secondary education, some tertiary, um, they have life commitments, they have families, they have obligations outside of work. Uh, and understanding what it takes to help them be successful in the, the job or in the in the program is important. So uh, we know that in, in programming, for example, software development, those types of skills, a, a, a test of adult basic education score of 100 is, is important. And if students don't have that, then understanding what the, the basic skills are necessary to get them up to that point. But beyond kind of those, those tactical educational pieces, it's things like career explore. How do you know what an advanced manufacturing technician does? What are the opportunities beyond you know, IT desk side services? So that career explore is incredibly important. So creating the opportunity for adult learners to actually see what those jobs look like. The second is to make it easier to take on that additional responsibility and obligation of, of learning. So we bring the we bring the coursework as much as we can into our facilities so that an employee can attend uh, training before their shift, after their shift, or come into, into the facility on a day when they're off. We also adjust work schedules to accommodate uh, education schedules. And then uh, last but not least, as employees are progressing along uh, their, their course, then helping them with interview skills, resume prep, and connecting them with the employers for whom we're providing that pipeline through job fairs. And then bringing alums back to talk with other associates about what it's like. Because, you know, Eric, if you see that I've gone off and done something, you say, wow, boy, if our dean can do that, I certainly can. And then we can have the conversation about what, what, was, the, what was the education like? What is the job like? And so really thinking about removing friction there. We also lean very heavily on. Uh, DOL registered apprenticeship programs, but not in the in what I would consider the more traditional programs. At, we have 10 registered programs that are focused exclusively in technology. So things like data center technician, solutions architect, uh, they sales support for our cloud computing business. These are fields that are highly technical. They provide a path to a, a, a career that pays very well. And we have, a, we have a program that's tailored very specifically for transitioning military veterans and spouses, because we know that these, this is also an underserved community where these kinds of programs can actually help accelerate their integration into the private sector. Excellent, thank you for that. And I wanna bring back in our uh, presenter, Aliza. Uh, work uh, by the OECD shows that some of the transformations uh, that predated the pandemic were magnified by COVID-19 and they did not affect all uh, groups equally as some of our presenters have already discussed. Uh, for example, in the last 18 months of show and how much we rely on digital technology to access work and education and how important it is for people uh, young and old to have the right digital skills. Yet uh, studies have shown gender gaps in digital skills remain pervasive. What do you think are the crucial challenges for gender equality in the years to come? And what role can lifelong learning policies play in closing gender gaps in the labor market? Thanks, uh, Eric. So, of course, hard to give one answer to this, but I think uh, mastery, mastery of digital technologies will prove crucial in the years to come. And so will be the ability to upskill and reskill and a little bit going into this, this resilience that Maureen was also talking to and this lifelong learning that we're focusing on. And, and indeed, some of the work we've conducted and the OECD indicates that uh, 
first, women lag behind men with respect to digital skills, and second, that they continue to experience barriers and, and challenges to participate in adult learning opportunities because of family responsibilities, but also sometimes social stigma and stereotypes around their ability to acquire skills in certain domains. Um, I think tackling gender uh, differences in digital skills is fundamental to achieve the objective of promoting female engagement uh, in upskilling and reskilling programs. This is because accessing learning programs uh, through digital technologies can reduce barriers related to some of the time pressure and, and caring responsibilities that, that we see. Um, we have to work with schools to ensure that young girls and boys, for that matter, develop strong digital skills because prevention is always better than, than providing or thinking or looking for a cure. This rests on uh, proving, um, providing also uh, professional development for teachers, but also creating partnerships between the education sector and the private sector where a lot of expertise lies and a lot of the really good experiences and, and initiatives that we hear of, of as, as well today. It's also important to design programs that are affordable and accessible to ensure that all adult women uh, acquire strong basic digital skills, but also that more women participate in shaping the future as well of the digital industry itself so that it better reflects uh, the needs and expectations of women. Um, and again, going back to some of the disparities I was talking to in, about in the in the presentations, that it's especially socioeconomically disadvantaged women who find it hard to develop their digital skills. And so there are various ways that countries have attempted to reach vulnerable populations in order to assist in promoting digital uh, basic digital skills and reemployment. There's lots of examples. Um, there's one interesting one in Korea, the Korea Job Hope Center, for instance, which offers re-employment re services for vulnerable uh, individuals age 40 and above, and it includes also counseling and guiding services for older workers who lack basic ICT skills and are very much likely to be disengaged from lifelong learning in the first place. Um, there's similar program for job seekers age 50 and above exist also in Australia with a career transition uh, assistance uh, program. In Belgium, there are innovative ways as well, uh, for instance, of reaching uh, populations. Uh, they have a mobile training information center that helps low qualified job seekers uh, in public locations such as parks and public squares. In, um, so there's there's a lot of examples out there that we can build upon. Excellent, excellent. I want to turn back to uh, Angela. The uh, skills outlook showed that in OECD countries, adults with lower levels of education and existing skills and from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds are less likely to participate in adult learning activities, including employer provided training. When asked why, the respondents from these backgrounds cite a lack of money, time, and interest as reasons. What do you think these find? What do you think of these findings and explanations say about the uh, equity in adult learning? Yeah, so so I think it says something about adult learning specifically, but actually, I think in some ways it says more about sort of the structure of our labor market overall, right? Like. Many of these things sort of indicate that because people are disadvantaged based on their income or race or gender, um, that those are the things, um, or a combination of all those things, that those are the things that are really persistent challenges, right? So like, if you don't have enough money to exit the labor market to get training, then, then it's going to be hard for you to get training. Or if you work for an employer that's not uh, is hesitant to provide it in part because you're in a low wage job or sort of precarious employment, then then you're less likely to get it as well. And so I think this is actually an area um, uh, of a lot of interest in part because it seems like there are some things that we could do kind of getting back to my earlier point about providing the types of comprehensive supports that people need um, to be able to participate in training, um, whether it's those things that, that are sort of at the training realm um, in terms of child transportation, um, uh, more foundational skills uh, development, um, and 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 I would also say, um, you know, it, this this uh, in in my mind also really underscores the need for um, additional employer engagement and some of those models that I talked about that are really focused on the types of partnerships that are um, needed to to help more marginalized groups. So, um, you know, whether that's the sector based training or registered apprenticeship, um, and and I think. To our Dean's point, there's a lot of sort of interesting apprenticeship work happening in the space 
um, that's not sort of focused on the traditional building and construction trades, but is really focused on uh, um, pathways into healthcare and childcare. These industries where we know women dominate, um, especially women of color dominate, but for a variety of reasons, um, including persistent labor market discrimination, uh, those industries are often undervalued, underpaid, um, and lack the type of training opportunities that are really necessary um, to help folks get ahead. So it, I don't know if that really answers your question, but I do think it's sort of the confluence of all of these things and the way that we help people access those um, training opportunities that they might not be taking advantage of now is sort of addressing those, bar those key barriers um, uh, as they exist, even when they don't sort of uh, uh, directly implicate like the, the training itself, but but sort of the other factors that surround it. Sure, sure. No, thank you. That makes that makes sense. Um, I just want to remind our audience that we're uh, also happy to take uh, your questions. Just uh, put them in the chat box, and we'll get to them in in a few moments. Um, wanted to. Uh, Turn back to our dean. Uh, Eliza highlighted how, uh, in general, those workers that would need most need to upgrade their skills or gain new skills to be competitive in the labor market are less likely to engage in learning opportunities on the job, as we just discussed. Based on your experience uh, at Amazon, can you highlight factors that can effectively promote participation among hard-to-reach groups and give us some examples of initiatives that have uh, shaped your thoughts on this? Um, it, probably the one that uh, we are laser focused on is Amazon Future Engineer. And Amazon Future Engineer is a four part childhood to career program that's designed to educate hundreds of thousands of students from underrepresented and underserved communities each year and to encourage them to try computer science and coding. And in the, the elementary years, this looks like professional development for teachers in, in K to five as so that they and grants so that they can build a sustainable program at the school. At the high school level, again, it's professional development for, for teachers as well as introduction to computer science and AP computer uh, classes that are provided digitally in a fully scaffolded and supported curriculum. And then scholarships, so 100, uh, $40,000 scholarships to underserved and underrepresented students in these programs. And those, their four year scholarships, $10,000 a year, and include a guaranteed paid internship at Amazon working with uh, in that software development computer science arena so that they're working um, much like an apprenticeship program with a qualified. Uh, software development engineer on real world uh, projects. And so by really sparking that interest, we know that we can increase to meet the demands that, that Elisa talked about, 21% demand increase for software development. And not just software development, but in a, many jobs that, uh, that are adjacent to um, our engineers, for example, require uh, tech, digital literacy. And we also find that, that folks that sit next to those jobs are interested in, um, in pursuing technical education. We have Amazon Technical Academy, which actually in nine months helps those uh, employees who do not have a technical degree attain the skills that they need in order to thrive and excel in a software development engineer role. So again, part of it is that exposure, whether it starts in kindergarten through childhood or it's on the job so that people have the opportunity to see what, what computing and cloud computing looks like. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and then I wanted to turn uh, back to Angela for one more since uh, I know you may need to sleep, slip out early. Um, when considering the school to work transition and skills acquisition, how did the Department of Labor and the Department of Education work together and, and where do their goals diverge? Uh, do you, and do you see more opportunity for collaboration in this administration? Yeah, so I know Maureen will talk about this as well, but I think the short answer is that we are incredibly aligned. Like I actually don't really think there's areas of divergence. I think there's areas of sort of more specialized expertise, um, you know, like, uh, uh, Department of Ed works with more um, uh, young people than, than we do, although we both work with young people. We have sort of robust youth programs that exist at DOL. Um, but, but I think that the sort of uh, theories that our work is grounded in are, are the same across our agencies. We really are committed to um, supporting workers and learners um, in a variety of respects by providing quality training and education programs, by ensuring that 
uh, marginalized and underserved communities are really at the center of our work and that equity is at the center of our work and that we're really sort of focused on um, producing good education and labor market outcomes uh, for, for the folks who we are targeting and serving. Um, I, I will say, um, you know, certainly I, I am new to this administration, I've been here six months, but um, I will say uh, for, um, for Secretary Walsh, and I'm sure Maureen will say the same for Secretary Cardona, um, that they have been very eager um, to uh, continue what I know has historically been a really strong collaboration across, of our, across our agencies. Um, they've uh, been meeting, they've done joint events together, um, and we're really trying to think about ways that we can work holistically um, to ensure that the work of our agencies is truly complementary. We have some, some programmatic things we do already. We administer uh, the Workforce Inter Innovation and Opportunity Act jointly. Um, many of the workforce investments that are proposed um, as a part of the AJP and Build Back Better agenda um, are uh, shared investments across um, uh, sort of in, in involve investments across labor and education. Um, but again, I really think at, at the core, we do have the same goals here. And so um, a lot of our work is focusing on um, how do we sort of improve the collaboration as we implement these new big things that are coming down the pike, um, but also how do we ensure that that foundation that's been there um, sort of prior to, to this, this administration really remains strong um, and that we're providing the best outcomes for the folks who we're serving. Excellent, excellent. And Maureen, I of course want to uh, allow you to add uh, to that, although I do have an audience question that was directed specifically to you, so I'll throw that in as well, um, which the audience question is, uh, what should universities be doing at this time to serve underrepresented students to ensure they are prepared for uh, the available opportunities? So if you could speak to that question and as well as the cross-agency collaboration. Okay, so um, as Angela said, our policy goals between the Department of Education and the Department of Labor are very well aligned. They are very much geared towards building back better with a laser focus on equity, that jobs, the education skills, jobs intersection is something that we're all working towards. So I think from that perspective, I don't see any holes in where we're all trying to, to go. We do, as Angela said, have areas of expertise um, and, and different roles by being the Department of Education and Department of, of Labor. Um, I wanted to mention something that I think also relates to the specific question um, that you that you mentioned, um, Eric, which is I wanted to talk about community colleges. Um, I mean, community colleges are a piece of our higher education system that's incredibly important. Um, it does, community colleges do many things. They help do remediation for people who come out of high school that, that didn't have uh, quite the education that they needed, so they can help with remediation. They provide several years of uh, less expensive education for people coming out of, of high school or people who are coming back for reskilling. I mean, it is a widely diverse population at the, at the community colleges and you can be getting a short-term certificate. You could be going to get a, uh, you know, your first two years of college. Um, you can be getting all kinds of things there and the ages and the backgrounds and the experiences of people coming into our community colleges is incredibly diverse. Um, in addition, community colleges are very tied into their communities. So when you're looking at labor markets and you're looking at labor markets that are local or regional, community colleges play a really important piece of that um, intersection between the business community and the education community. And how do you help people come out with the skills and the competencies that are needed in the labor markets of that area? And um, I happen to know there's a very good program that Amazon has with Northern Virginia Community College, which I've visited in the past. Um, again, so that I just want to make sort of bring in that the, that the role that the higher education system plays, and in one particular case, the community college system plays in um, helping to get people trained and with skills needed in the local labor markets is phenomenally important. They even they even tailor programs to match up to what a business needs. So there's all kinds of pieces. That's one part of the university system. So the question the person asked is, is maybe perhaps broader than that. Um, universities do quite a bit to bring in, um, you know, people who are first generation college students, people from less advantaged backgrounds, people from, you know, uh, sort of historically underrepresented groups. And they really work to try to help bring those people up and give them opportunities. Uh, and there's lots of extra support on universities. It's still, a, it's still a, a, often a big reach. Um, in the sense that you don't have equal outcomes when you're coming out of university um, between people who came in uh, from more disadvantaged backgrounds and less, less advantaged backgrounds. But there's a really important equity piece 
and quality piece that's being played on every college campus. Um, and one that uh, the support from the federal government is helping, Pell Grants, for instance, I mean, are designed to help uh, lower income people to be able to go on to some kind of uh, post, post high school education. Uh, those are provided to lots of people. So it's the equity agenda in higher education from a federal government perspective is substantial in the support. We have support programs that you know, target historically black colleges and universities. We have programs that um, target underrepresented people through um, you know, upward bound that you know, brings kids in that, that haven't had college opportunities before, exposes them to what's at college, what it is you need to do to go there. They target kids early. We have gear up program that targets kids early for sort of saying, okay, we need to have partnerships to see what kind of skills you need, what kind of education you need. You need it's really important to pick algebra and math because if you don't take them, then you don't have the foundation to build off and make sure kids know that in the sixth grade, the seventh grade, so they're not trying to play catch up later. Someone mentioned prevention earlier. And you know, a lot of these things, if you can build things in earlier, you don't have to come back and fix them later. And that's always better. Now, obviously we do have to do come back and do remediation, but the more that you can have knowledge and research, you know, which shows the, the sort of scaffolding of kinds of classes and skills you need in order to be able to go to the next level, that's really important. So it's just a couple of things. Sure. Thank you. Um, I want to kind of bring in a, a back to an international perspective. After all, this is the OECD. Um, Elisa, could you, uh, in your presentation, you emphasize the importance on promoting a lifelong learning mindset, but also reducing barriers to participation for all those who are willing to engage uh, in learning, but are currently unable to engage because of barriers and impediments. What did you learn about the best practices across the OEDC on what governments can do to support workers and businesses to invest in skills development? So, so there's really no one best approach and what we can do at the OECD is of course flag uh, interesting initiatives. There's a lot. I think there's the one I mentioned in Belgium, this form truck, which is this mobile training information center that engages with low qualified job seekers at public locations and parks and public squares. Um, in France, our host country, there's uh, lots of transformations of the educational system are currently ongoing. Um, there are uh, initiatives looking, intending to increase the number of apprentices, uh, to create training accounts. There's also uh, specific on the job training programs targeted for small and medium enterprises that are applied in firms with fewer than 300 employees, uh, prioritize low-skilled individuals and diverse participants' profiles, including new hires, experienced workers, but also unemployed persons. Um, in Germany, there's an interesting initiative as well around story-based learning, uh, which is part of this program called e-video transfer. Uh, they've been doing it for years now, the project uh, offers digital learning opportunities for workers with low basic skills and limited time to participate in classroom learning. Um, it intends to develop, uh, it's, it develops industry specific training, um, and, but combines instruction on basic skills and professional knowledge. All the training is web based and it takes the learner through an engaging storyline, which is conveyed through videos. So quite interesting because um, even though users must have a basic level of digital literacy, they also uh, have included a learning module about how to use a mouse and a keyboard, uh, which was developed to reach an even wider target group. Um, in Canada, across your own border, there's federal funding used to provide training and employment supports to uh, individual across Canada through bilateral labor market uh, transfer agreements with provinces and territories. Um, there's also uh, experiences in New Zealand has been focusing on improving productivity performance and has singled out the poor use of skills in workplaces as a key policy issue. Uh, so there's the high performance working initiative that helps SMEs streamline work in Australia. There's Australian also example in increasing uh, innovation and productivity in, in firms. So there's really lots of interesting initiatives. I think 
I would say one of the interesting initiatives is also what we're doing here is really to bring together also, and what, that's what we do at the OECD Center for Skills, is to bring as well together education and labor and the private sector and have this conversation and, and hear from each other. And that's really what we want to continue as well, I think would be essential in, in advancing a lot of the issues that we have been saying today. Great, great. Want well, to just bring in a few more uh, audience questions before we have to wrap up. Uh, uh, one for uh, Ardeen. Uh, do you have any data showing how effective your partnering with higher education and continuing education organizations is and how many of your associates have moved on to higher wage careers from Amazon? Is Amazon taking advantage of this education by hiring within as associates gain more skills? So lots of, lots of questions there. Yes, um, stacking them. Yeah, so I, 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 and I also would love to build on something that, that Maureen and, and Elisa said. So uh, we, we do have data. The programs are so wide and varied uh, right now that it, it, to, to dive into that level, I think, wouldn't, wouldn't, serve, uh, wouldn't serve well. But we do, um, we, we're due to publish an update on our upskilling, um, our upskilling pledge. And so that should be coming out relatively soon. I think that the, when we do take advantage, we, I mean, the, the, we hire for, we hire for fit and people move a tremendous amount inside the company. Career choice is primarily designed to place people in jobs that are outside of Amazon because our logistics network is very wide and distributed. And in many cases, what calls people for their vocation it may not be to work in, uh, in a logistics environment. And so by providing that opportunity, they can in fact, if there are jobs available locally with Amazon, then we absolutely make those uh, paths available. The, the piece I wanna to come to that, that, that both Elisa and, and Maureen said is, and I'm gonna put a little more color on it is, number one, the collaboration between secondary schools and tertiary schools, whether that's high school, community college and four-year schools. And Maureen uh, cited one of, our, one of my favorites in, here in Arlington near Nova and then the partnership with George Mason and the Arlington High Schools in cloud computing. Um, because those are students who actually leave high school with very close to an associate's degree, move into uh, community college, and then immediately are attached to an advisor at, at George Mason University, for example, so that they are taking courses that articulate. And so what you end up with are stackable, stackable credentials. So a student can leave high school, and if they can't, don't have the financial wherewithal to go to school full time, they have skills that actually translate into an in-demand job and then can go perhaps to night school and add to those. So that, that collaboration from secondary school all the way through tertiary is incredibly important for dual enrollment, for articulation, which means that the credits move easily. And so the students are only taking classes at, that move towards those those uh, graduating programs. And then the, the other piece that, um, that Elisa said is you really want to create programs internationally that, that provide people access to skills. So technical, um, technical degrees, for example, or technical training tends to have what we call fresh and stating. You have to keep those skills current. So I learned a program on punch cards, for example. That isn't a very popular skill anymore. But what we do know is that distributed computing, while we may not be programming on punch cards, we call it cloud computing now. And so if we take existing curriculum and we integrate technologies like cloud computing into those, into courses that, uh, that high schools and community colleges and four-year colleges are already teaching, so that you actually add those KSAs in, the knowledge, skills, and abilities to make them job specific, you can help by convening those schools with employers to modify the curriculum more quickly and be agile. So they're actually able to respond to that job need. And community colleges play an incredibly important role here um, for us as employers and for conveners as we bring together educators and employers to help move us forward. And, and following up on that uh, in, the, in the question here, is there is it the case that some of the folks being upskilled, maybe they're in a logistics center, that are they taking then very technical jobs? Is that a pathway that exists at Amazon? Um, or are they getting upskilled and then maybe moving to another employer? So it's both. 
Um, the vast majority of our career choice graduates do join another employer. Our top three fields are in no particular order, our IT, uh, so in the software and hardware space, uh, commercial driving and medical. We do um, pre-apprenticeship programs, medical assistance, so those kinds of jobs that actually put people on a career ladder. Um, we have a program called that I mentioned earlier, Amazon Technical Academy, that provides nine in nine months, equips employees whether or not they have a, a degree with the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they need to successfully thrive in a software development engineering one role. And we've graduated more than 700 of those students and 98% of them are in, landed in software development engineer one roles and they're being promoted to software development engineer two. And those are highly technical roles that typically require a four-year university degree or a combination of two-year and four-year. Um, and so we're very, we're very proud of what that's done because we're helping to meet the demand and create that diverse pipeline of, of technically savvy talent that we need to, to solve customers' problems. Thank you. And I just wanted to, as we're getting close to the time here, uh, turn back to uh, Maureen um, and, and ask a little bit more about the classroom. Um, experts say fostering a love of learning is crucial to engage uh, students in lifelong learning. Uh, teachers can be a crucial to uh, promote a lifelong learning mindset. Uh, what policies and programs can you highlight uh, that support uh, continuous professional development of teachers uh, so that they are well equipped to help their students? Um, Eric, I'm going to take a chance to answer a slightly different uh, twist on that question, uh, and uh, partly because what I want to highlight is something that's international in nature as well, not because there aren't lots of things that we do in the Department of Education, but I know time's tight. Um, the Secretary of Education, the United States, is hosting the International Summit on the Teaching Profession um, virtually in October, and that is uh, something we do uh, jointly with OECD and Education International, which represents teacher unions worldwide. We bring together the top 25 education systems, the ministers and the teacher unions together to talk about issues about how we can improve the teaching profession, but in, how do we improve the, and enhance the teaching profession in order to improve and enhance student learning. And this year, um, uh, we're gonna focus again on this whole child and we're gonna focus on the title is Excellence and Equity. Um, and we have a whole lot of different topics within the whole child, but it includes well-being. It includes how do you develop all of these different kinds of characteristics and how do you have teachers who help to do that? What do teachers need to, know, to, to have as support to be able to do that? And learn from 25 other uh, education systems in the, around the world of what they do in general, but also what they've experienced during the pandemic and how they're translating that into improved uh, teacher policies, improve teacher professionalism, improve teacher training, um, be it continuous professional development or pre uh, earlier ed education. So um, I just want to put that in because I think it's a really important international endeavor in the space that you're talking about, which is teachers. A great teacher is absolutely essential to a great education. Yeah, sounds like a great way to improve uh, teachers by learning from from others around around the world. Um, we're just about at time, so I just want to give all our uh, panelists just a, a chance to to wrap up um, and kind of ask a fun one. Uh, you know, in a, in a few words, if we gave you a magic wand uh, to make your lifelong uh, learning policy wishes come true, uh, how would you use it? And I'll, I'll start with Aliza. Well, I'd like to have several if I can of those magic ones if, and, and renewable if I can. Um, I think really the, the key messages from, from uh, the report are important for us in terms of this, the, the lifelong learning uh, mindset, making sure that there, the, the affordability, accessibility, uh, the modular uh, possibilities in terms of, of accessing those, uh, making them uh, available uh, for people in different uh, settings at different times. I think it's really, if we can take something out of this pandemic is the need for us to rethink some of the processes we have had in place and perhaps see it. Uh, I, I would never say that the pandemic is an opportunity in any way because of, of the, the hurt we've had all of it through it. But I think we do need to, to, to see that we have to do a bit of a reset on some of these processes. And, and uh, as Maureen said, and as uh, 
our dean and and all of the panelists today have said as well i think we we are in a position now where we're thinking about working more together and uh, learning from all of these initiatives and the best practices and that's really what we will continue to do from our side thanks sure our dean closing thoughts well, magic wand. I think there's so much in those early years for students in terms of foundational um, work. And we, we, you know, Elisa talked about, you know, or maybe it was anyway, one of the panels about algebra, right? About that foundational piece. Algebra is probably one of the key um, resources for anyone who's interested in algorithms or logic structures for, for programming. So it's just essential to digital literacy. So providing equitable, high quality, accessible education to children around the world to prepare them for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow uh, in a way that's accessible to them would be my magic wand. I have no idea how we would accomplish all of that, but that's the thing to me that would be most critical. Excellent. And we'll hand the wand uh, to Maureen to finish up. So I think our Dean's wand, if it worked with mm -hmm. everything. Um, so I'm gonna put in a little bit more of a whimsical one, which is in this whole discussion of lifelong learning, we're talking about from little kids to, you know, the end of our lives. I would love to see more engagement across age groups. Um, I just think the opportunities of engagement and learning between young people, people in their middle years, between people in their older years, is a phenomenal opportunity for you know, keeping older people engaged in, in lifelong learning, but also engaging young people and understanding kind of what lives have been and how lives have changed and all that. That's just kind of a personal thing I, that I love seeing the interaction that comes in family settings in, in work settings and community settings that crisscrosses all of the generations. And that's not that easy to do and it doesn't happen all the time, but I think the benefits from a lifelong learning perspective and a quality of life would be enormous. So thank you. All right, that great note to, to finish on. Thank you to all of our panelists and uh, thank you to the OECD for uh, inviting me to be part of this event. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. I certainly learned a lot and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon.